unless you've been to Russia, you probably never heard of Serniki. And it's my duty to do something about it. Serniki are little pan-fried cheesecakes. They are way less sweet and decadent than an American cheesecake, but what they like in decadence, they more than make up for in character, with a delicate crust holding the moist and tangy inside. Russians love them for breakfast the way Americans love pancakes. If you have made serniki before and ended up with disintegrating puddles of cheese or rubbery hockey pucks, you've come to the right place. Today we'll get to the root cause of these problems and learn how to solve them. When researching this dish, I have watched a lot of Russian videos and they fall into two categories. The grandmas and the professional chefs. The grandmas think it's easy. It's like watching Italian grandmas make pasta. Measurements? What measurements? The professional chefs admit that the dish presents a serious challenge. They give perfect measurements in grams, but there is a catch. Their measurements only work if your farmer's cheese is the exact same consistency as theirs. They tell you to try all different brands until you finally find the brand that works for their recipe. My solution to this problem is to make my own farmer's cheese. Yes, you'll have to plan two days ahead, but the active time is about 15 minutes. I just made a video about it, it's linked in the description below. Trust me, it will be way faster, cheaper and easier than trying to track down multiple brands of farmer's cheese outside of Russia. If you do have access to store-bought farmer's cheese, you can certainly use it. I'll show you how to adjust its consistency until it will work in this recipe. Just make sure the cheese you buy lists whole milk as the main ingredient, not low-fat milk. I doubt you'll find farmer's cheese made with milk and cream in the US, but if you do, that's not what you want for this recipe. High-fat farmer's cheese is very tasty, but hard to shape. If your farmer's cheese is too wet, you'll need to use a lot of flour, which will produce a doughy texture. But you can easily solve this problem by removing excess moisture. Lay a piece of foil on your counter, followed by three pieces of paper towel. Mine is nice and thick. If yours is thin, you'll need more than three layers. Spread your cheese in a circle about this size. Top with three layers of paper towel, foil, and the heaviest part you've got in your kitchen or some other weight. I find that when this procedure is done immediately after the cheese finishes draining, but before refrigeration, the water comes out very quickly and five minutes is all it takes. If you're doing it after the cheese was already chilled, it will take around 20 minutes to get the paper towels nicely saturated. If you haven't yet chilled the cheese, chill it now. This will help it stiffen. For store-bought cheese, you might need to repeat this draining procedure multiple times since it might be wetter than mine. Here is my cheese, drained, pressed, and chilled. To test if you got the right consistency, take a handful of cheese and roll it into a bowl. It should leave a light residue on your hands, but it should not stick to you. See how my hands are not too messy? Now try to mold it into some shape like a disc. It should feel moldable like Play-Doh and should hold any shape you give it. If it doesn't hold the shape you give it, it's too wet. No worries, just repeat the pressing procedure until your cheese passes this test. If it's already cold, you don't need to re-chill it after pressing. If your cheese is prone to cracking and crumbling and leaves no residue on your hands when you roll it into a bowl, it's too dry. Ideally, you want to avoid the situation, but if it happens, you can compensate by adding more eggs than I do in my recipe. I have 350 grams of cheese here. Only weigh the cheese after you remove enough water for it to pass the shaping test. If you're buying farmer's cheese, buy at least 500 grams to account for moisture removal. Let's set the bowl on the scale, zero it out, and add the eggs. Put two yolks in the cheese and the whites into a separate bowl. 
then beat the whites a little with the fork to break them up, otherwise they'll be hard to scoop. Add enough white until the total egg amount is 50 grams. You'll only need a little, so scoop rather than pour. Once the whites start pouring, they are hard to stop. Using more yolks than whites produces a richer, creamier texture. If your cheese felt too dry and was cracking when you tried to mold it, add an extra 15 grams of egg white. Keep an egg white in case you need them later to adjust the consistency. Add 45 grams of sugar and 2 grams of salt. For the salt, either use a high precision scale or teaspoons. Don't weigh 2 grams on a regular kitchen scale. Add half a teaspoon of vanilla extract and mash it all together with a potato masher. If you don't have one, just use a spoon or spatula, but the potato masher works great for smoothing out the cheese. By the way, don't even think of using a food processor or a mixer. They will liquefy your cheese. The reason we add the eggs is lightness. They prevent our serniki from tasting like hockey pucks. But as you can see, we lost that moldable texture. That's where the flour comes in. We have to be careful not to overdo it. Too much flour will make them taste doughy, so we'll only add 35 grams. Stir it in with a spatula, be thorough and make sure the mixture is homogeneous, but don't mix too much so that the flour doesn't develop too much gluten. It's normal and desirable for the consistency to be softer than the cheese was originally. If you get the consistency of Play-Doh at this point, stir in more egg white until it feels like very thick mashed potatoes. See, this dough is too thick because it was made with overdried cheese, and this dough is just right. Put the bowl back on the scale and add 35 grams of golden raisins. They intentionally unsoaked, which will help absorb some of the moisture in the dough. Stir them in, and we're ready to shape. Place a piece of parchment paper on top of a cutting board or a baking sheet and sprinkle it with flour. This is where we'll place our finished cakes. Sprinkle your work surface very generously with flour and dump the dough on top. I know I told you how evil the flour was and how it would result in doughy cakes, but that's only the flour you mix in. The flour you keep on the outside will help you shape and will give you a nice crust on the outside. So don't be afraid to be very generous. Flour your hands and roll the dough into a rough log that's about 8 to 9 inches long. Keep flouring your dough until it cooperates. Ok, this looks good. To shape the cakes, cut a 1 inch chunk of dough with a pastry scraper. Flip it back and forth to coat it in flour on both sides. Then spin it with your pastry scraper and your hand to flatten out the sides. Then flatten out the top. Keep alternating like this between the sides and the top until you get a nice little cake that is 3 quarters of an inch thick. Brush of excess flour, transfer it to the floured parchment paper and keep on going until you finish the log. Since the dough is so soft, your log will flatten out as it sits, so before you cut the next piece, rotate it 90 degrees. This will help your pieces start out more round than oval. Coat the piece in flour on both sides, flatten out the sides, flatten out the top, and keep going like this until you are happy with the shape. Brush off the flour. And you have another sernik. That's the singular for serniki. You'll get 8 to 9 cakes from this recipe. You can certainly fry your serniki right away, but I prefer to put them in the fridge overnight. It firms them up, making them easier to cook, and it lets me sleep in the next morning, since all the hard work is already done. If you're saving them for the next morning, let them chill in the fridge uncovered for 30 to 60 minutes, then loosely cover them with plastic. This will avoid condensation. The cooking is the easy part. Set a 12-inch non-stick skillet of a medium heat. Add 2 teaspoons of butter and a tablespoon of neutral oil like canola. When the butter is bubbly, swirl the pan to coat it evenly and add the cakes. Cover and reduce the heat to low. Cooking the serniki gently and slowly will prevent them from burning on the outside or turning rubbery inside. Cook for 5 minutes or until golden. 
If you're flipping them with tongues, be careful not to squish them. To me, the easiest way to flip them is an offset spatula, but be gentle with your pan so that you don't scratch it. Dry any moisture that accumulated on the lid, cover them up and continue to cook on moderately low heat until the other side browns. This will take about five minutes. Get them out of the pan, cool for a couple of minutes and serve. I am perfectly happy eating them plain, but most people like them with sour cream and cherry jam. Here, let me show you the inside. See how the crust is crispy, but very thin and the inside is soft, moist and supple. In case you like a little math with your breakfast, here's my recipe with percentages based on the weight of the farmer's cheese. You aren't always going to have 350 grams of cheese, so knowing how to calculate the other ingredients for any amount of cheese is handy. I promise it's not hard. Say I have 500 grams of cheese instead of 350, and I want to calculate the weight of sugar. Sugar is 13%. 13% of 500 is 65, so I'll need 65 grams of sugar. The only ingredient that's a bit tricky here are the eggs because dividing the yolks is a pain. As long as your total amount of the egg is 14% of the cheese weight and as long as you're using more yolks than whites, it's all good. For example, if I had 400 grams of cheese, my total egg weight would be 14% of 400, which is 56. I could get that by combining two yolks with enough white to get 56 grams, or I could use three yolks and almost no white. In case you have a Russian grandma, you might not want to mention my little system to her. She can probably make the most perfect Tserniki without a single number crossing her mind, but that's because she's made them hundreds of times. The first time round, a little precision won't hurt. <laughs> Here are more very detailed culinary tutorials for you to check out and a link to my online classes is in the description below.